Hello, everybody. Uh, my guest today is Dr. Robert Cutler, uh, Senior Research Fellow and Director of Energy Security Program at NATO Association of Canada. Dr. Cutler, thank you very much indeed for being with us. I'm most grateful to you for your time. Oh, it's my pleasure to, uh, to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's our pleasure. Uh, what was the first time when you heard about Azerbaijan? You heard the word Azerbaijan, the name of the country. Well, that would have been uh, back in 1970. Five, when I first started to study Soviet foreign policy, uh, the first professor of, I had who taught my first course on Soviet foreign policy had published a book in the late 1950s about the Union Republics in Soviet diplomacy. So that was probably the first time I had heard uh, of Azerbaijan when it was the uh, Azerbaijan SSR. And you've been following um, Azerbaijani Armenian conflict since the very beginning, I believe, uh, since early 90s or since late 80s. Yes, yes. When the Soviet Union fell apart, I uh, decided that I would not spend all my time on Russia, but there were many other more interesting parts of the Soviet Union, and Azerbaijan was one of them. So you've been following Azerbaijan, you've seen Azerbaijan develop, evolve, and in one of your recent articles, you described Azerbaijan as a middle power. Yes. Uh, in your judgment, according to your definition of uh, middle power, what was the most important event which took place during this stage? And that was the most important contributing factor to Azerbaijan's status as a middle power. Well, the foundation uh, without which Azerbaijan would not now have the status of a middle power in world politics as its initiative to uh, motivate the creation of the Southern Gas Corridor. This is the first move that put Azerbaijan on the European uh, diplomatic map, so to speak. And of course, it also created the basis for uh, a great deal of national wealth that Azerbaijan may devote and has devoted to developing instruments of uh, diplomacy and including uh, popular well-being and so on that uh, give it a profile uh, and give it the means to realize a profile of being a middle power. Uh, but the mean to this profile that I refer to involves its uh, espousal of uh, participation in international organizations, very much like Canada during the Cold War was uh, called a middle power. The first to, to begin to call itself a middle power. Uh, the British phrase is punching above their weight. And I think it's very clear that Azerbaijan uh, does this uh, as well. Uh, Thank you very much indeed. And uh, I understand Azerbaijan has entrenched its position as a middle power after the Second Karabakh War, probably, and before that it was in the making, I suppose, the status. And about the Second Karabakh War, now there's the Azerbaijani Armenian normalization. There are a couple of mediators. Moscow has been there from the very beginning, then Brussels, then Washington. My question is do you believe peace treaty is feasible within the next year? before 2025, before the end of the trilateral declaration, and when it is signed uh, amongst the mediators, mediators, which one will be the most consequential one? Well, it is certainly feasible, uh, depending upon the wills and the efforts of the parties concerned. Uh, it could be realized. Uh, as to which of the mediators uh, drives, uh, as it is known now, Washington is the one as your foreign minister said just three weeks ago, uh, Washington is the only mediator now uh, making uh, consistent and constructive efforts, uh, partly because uh, uh, Russia uh, has its own priorities, which do not accord entirely with those of either Armenia or Azerbaijan. And Armenia became disenchanted with the uh, Charles Michel uh, process when, uh, it, when the invitation to Emmanuel Macron to make it a quadrilateral was not accepted by Azerbaijan. So, as you know, in international negotiations, there's a sort of what they call forum shopping that goes on. And now it, uh, the ball is, so to speak, in Washington's court. Uh, yeah, and the, the, the meetings currently underway there, that's been from the uh, Monday. And we very much hope that something tangible will emerge out of it. Not peace treaty itself, but something leading to peace treaty, perhaps. And Russia. It looks like a spoiler in Azerbaijan to us, to many people. And uh, 
Recently, uh, the Russian official, the spokesperson of uh, the president, uh, Dmitry Peskov, said that everything Azerbaijan and Armenia are going to agree on is to be within the framework of the Russia-mediated trilateral format and the documents signed within that framework. From what he says, it appears that we need to sort out this problem within the trilateral format, and if we decide on something bilateral, then of course it should be in line with trilateral format. What is your view about this Russian uh, worldview? Well, it is to be anticipated that uh, Russian diplomacy should insist on this point of view. This point of view uh, is the best in alignment with Russian uh, interests in the region. However, uh, the trilateral declaration has no status in international law that excludes bilateral or even other trilateral with either Brussels or with uh, the United States uh, forums. Uh, there is no normative or legal basis for uh, Mr. Peskov's uh, insistence. And what is also very interesting, when Azerbaijan and Armenia agree on something in Brussels, for example, in Prague, uh, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, in early October, the principle of sovereignty and the mutual recognition of territorial integrity, and it also, these principles were later incorporated into the Moscow format as well. So, it looks like that they are also being influenced by what is being decided in other, in other platforms. Yes, it is uh, a uh, diplomatic uh, means of maintaining influence uh, without insisting on the point. I should say that uh, as a former expert in Soviet foreign policy, this was also characteristic of Soviet and, and, and it's not just Soviet. I mean, the Chinese foreign policy insists this about Chinese programmatic declarations uh, simply in order to try to crowd out or exclude uh, other possible influences. So um, the fact that certain things are included into Moscow and so on. Uh, Moscow is not a sine qua non of a peace settlement. Uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia are the only two uh, whose uh, agreement is necessary. One very clear example, when Azerbaijan did make it very clear that Azerbaijan is going to install border checkpoint at the entrance of the Russian mm -hmm. road, Russia said it, it can't happen because it's not within the trilateral format, but Azerbaijan did it and Russia acquiesced eventually. So we see how the things are developing there. And if Azerbaijan and Armenia agree on something in Washington, Moscow, again, will need to incorporate that particular agreement into its own platform as well. Yes, well, this is um, typical of, of any uh, power that wishes to maintain its, uh, its influence is to uh, make declarations uh, in the effort to influence facts on the ground or to prevent facts on the ground from being established simply by diplomatic intimidation. It's, it's, it's simply di diplomatic intimidation. And, uh, I want to also ask about Nikol Pashinyan, Armenian Prime Minister. He's a critical figure, he leads mm -hmm. Armenia. And uh, do you think, I mean, his last address to the National Assembly was very interesting. He reflected on a couple of very important moments. And it is very clear that he has the vision of peace. But the question is whether he has the necessary determination and the factible character, ability to deal with all the opposition which is currently in Armenia, does, does he have what it takes to actually become, to become a peacemaker? It's more than personal qualities that are at issue. Uh, it's easy to forget that uh, the Karabakh clan uh, ran Armenia for 20 years. This gave them a lot of time to seed the government apparatus with their own people at every level from the local up to the national. As for example, when there were uh, military clashes provoked by Armenian uh, military formations a year or two ago, uh, I instinctively recognized that these, that these formations are likely directed by people, uh, commanders whose political uh, allegiance is to the Karabakh clan, and this is why they were seeking to sabotage any rapprochement between Armenia and Azerbaijan. So it's not just a question of personal character. Uh, it's, that's important, and he's uh, a fascinating study of a political leader. There's been a shift in Armenian society, and the result of the 2021 election, I think, was a very clear indication of that. Mm -hmm. Although Pashinyan wasn't very popular, but he was more popular than 
other candidates? Yes, the uh, Armenian electorate uh, made the clear declaration that they were uh, tired of being taken advantage of by uh, their own politicians and, dare I say, by uh, our politicians and uh, activists of Armenian extraction uh, outside of Armenia, uh, and that they were uh, tired of their children dying in wars and uh, that they'd had enough. And up until 2021, they hadn't been given an opportunity to express this. And they finally received the opportunity. And despite the catastrophic capitulation of the Armenian military in 2020, they still re-endorsed uh, Pashinyan uh, with an overwhelming majority that was uh, quite remarkable. And I would like to move, to move on to the subject of Iran which is a fascinating subject, has always been fasc fascinating. Some people in Azerbaijan, not all of them, of course, there's an expert circus, you meet this kind of people, who say that Iran is, a, is an existential threat to uh, Azerbaijan. And there are those in Iran who believe that modern Azerbaijan, with its own characteristics, is actually an existential threat to, uh, to Iran. Uh, what is your take on this two comments and views? Well. It is, seems to me uh, to be a fair assessment that uh, Iran, the, the current uh, ruling elite in Tehran, uh, are a, an existential threat to the present state structure of Azerbaijan, which they would like to replace with something that they could control. Uh, at the same time, uh, there have been declarations since the late 1990s of uh, personal threats by the Iranian chief of staff against the person of the president of Azerbaijan with warnings uh, to, uh, to be more observant of uh, Shiite uh, norms, what they believe to be Shiite norms. Uh, and, uh, and even uh, this persists until recently, as you uh, well know, the uh, arrest, the, the attempted assassination of one of your parliamentary deputies yeah. You know, that it's not simply rhetoric, rhetorically that Iran is uh, an existential threat to Azerbaijan, but it is, uh, by its persistent behavior, it has shown that it is uh, not a constant friend of the present government. And uh, it looks like, at least to me, I could be wrong, but I feel that, uh, and many people in this country, that as long as the regime there is unchanged, the relations between Azerbaijan and Iran will be kind of perennial tug of war. This relation will always be problematic and they need to be controlled. So they will never be very, very friendly. Do well, you, you subscribe to this? Uh, oh, yes, skeptical? yes. And, and in this regard, it deserves to be underlined that uh, the uh, ruling elite in Tehran uh, has ceased to be, uh, in any regard, theocratic. Uh, with about five years ago when the IRGC completed its soft coup. Uh, the R IRGC, as you know, domestically, 15, 20 years ago, started out as an economic mafia uh, inside Iran, and they took over. They, 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 they compelled government subsidies to <clears throat> industrial concerns, which they then forced the owners out of. And they became a greater, actually, you know, within the IRGC, there are several different families, so to speak. But uh, by and large, uh, it's no longer, it's only rhetorically a theocratic regime. And this is a, also a, 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 a fig leaf uh, for its um, rather impression, impression it's, it's very impression making uh, hostility toward Israel. Uh, and it's institutionalized uh, anti-Semitism uh, that uh, is given the fig leaf of uh, Islamic fundamentalism trying to take away from Turkey the uh, value of being a Palestinian, the greatest Palestinian defender of the Palestinians. But that's gone by the wayside because it's the IRGC now that runs those things and their interests uh, also coincide with those uh, more and more of the uh, of certain sectors of the Armenian uh, political elite, in particular those uh, military, economic, military and security sectors of the economy, in particular, where their concrete and specific and practical cooperation has significantly deepened over the last eighteen months. And um, 
So Iran, Azerbaijan, relations are going to be always complex. Uh, and what will become of this multi-ethnic empire in the fullness of time, do you think? There is no empire, uh, land, there is no landed empire of multi-ethnic peoples that has survived uh, except for the Russian Federation. Uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, disappeared. Uh, the uh, German Empire never really took hold. Uh, and uh, even the, the French and the British empires are slightly different because they were overseas empires. They were not continental empires. They were maritime empires. But still, they dissipated in each in, in its own way. So one must expect that at some indefinite time in the future, perhaps newer rather than further future, that the integrity, so to speak, of the Iranian regime, which is to say the current Iranian, the current constitution of the IRI will cease to be applicable to the situation on the ground. Because Iranian objections in relation to certain projects matter a great deal. After 2020, after the Second Karabakh War, the geopolitics of the region has changed in favor of Azerbaijan and Turkey, and Iran doesn't like it. And Iran does not want to adjust to these realities. And as long as they are in opposition, it is very clear that some certain problems will happen. For example, the Engazu Corridor. They believe it's their red line. Do you believe Iran will cooperate with Turkey and Azerbaijan in this mega project, or it will continue uh, to be recalcitrant? Azerbaijan, I'm sorry, Iran sees the Zangazur Corridor as against its own interests for uh, well known reasons. Uh, Iran, uh, it's not quite correct to say that Iran fails to accept the results of the Second Karabakh War. They, because they do accept the shrinking of the uh, Russian uh, influence in the South Caucasus. And correspondingly, they seek to increase their own uh, through Armenia in particular as a, a, an instrument. So uh, what they do not like is um, that any country in the region should have any autonomy of, uh, of Tehran. That is uh, their um, rather self-centered, non-outward uh, looking, inward, this is their inward looking perspective. They uh, share this perspective with uh, other uh, monolithic totalitarian uh, powers uh, whom I would name upon request. So you were in Shusha, it was your first time in Shusha, and Shusha declarations were signed in Shusha as well. It's a very important document. Uh, could you evaluate its place uh, in Azerbaijan's security arrangements within this wider uh, region? And uh, do you believe Shusha declaration is a threat to Iran? Those are two different questions. Yes. Let me take them in reverse order. Uh, the Shusha Declaration is not a threat to Iran because it is not uh, because it does not name Iran as a common enemy. Very simply, in the 19th century, you had such treaties that named a common enemy. It, it, this does not, and it provides for defensive consultations and, if necessary, defensive action without naming uh, any uh, without naming any potential adversary. So it is not a threat against Iran. Uh, it's very very simple and straightforward. Uh, as for the Shusha Declaration's uh, place in, let us call it, Azerbaijan's national uh, structure for assuring its uh, independent sovereignty and national security, uh, it is very interesting that it is a treaty with a NATO member uh, and uh, that uh, Azerbaijan has taken uh, a road to ass toward assuming, uh, assuring its national security that was not taken by Ukraine and Georgia. And in fact, events demonstrate that this was uh, a good road to take. Uh, in 2008, as you recall, the Bucharest summit, NATO uh, denied to both Georgia and Ukraine a, an, M an, an MAP, a roadmap for uh, adjoining NATO. And uh, this was taken, uh, this happened in the spring. Uh, there are those who suggest 
that this was taken by Putin as a green light for his subsequent invasion of Georgia in August 2008. So uh, one of the key components of uh, middle power status is in terms of Azerbaijan, it's energy export capabilities. Mm -hmm. Azerbaijan is an important player, but Azerbaijan is not going to replace Russian gas. We understand it. And Azerbaijan has got a sense of proportion, sense of measure, as we understand. If we're not going to save Europe, we will play an important role. Mm -hmm. Could you in a nutshell explain the gist of that role, and gist and the crux of that role, and how important it is in real terms? Because when we in Azerbaijan talk about our importance, we may mm -hmm. be under the, we may, we, may, we may fall into the trap of exaggerating our significance. Mm -hmm. But what's its real value uh, for the years to come? Azerbaijan is a very important energy supplier to southern and southeastern Europe. It will, it will become more important uh, with the, uh, the, the gas ring that you know about. Uh, the accords uh, for the use of the Trans-Balkan Trans -Balkan pipeline and so on. These uh, countries uh, have relatively small markets uh, and therefore the uh, amounts of gas that Azerbaijan can make available, uh, although those are also relatively small in traditional terms, they're not like 30 billion cubic meters like a real, like a real regular pipeline is. Uh, uh, for example, the TANAP is 16, but it can be expanded to 30 without the need to build a parallel pipeline. All you need to do is to insert more compressors and a few other technical fixes. Uh, so that uh, for a country like Bulgaria or Hungary or Serbia or Albania or Romania, even uh, a few, a uh, handful, of handful being five or less, because there are five fingers on a hand. Uh, five or, or fewer billion cubic meters can make a, a big difference. Even one or two can make a big difference uh, because the, their markets are so small. Uh, and uh, the doubling, the foreseeable, I think it's already foreseen, uh, doubling of the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline, uh, which follows through from the TANAP through the Southern Gas Corridor uh, to Southern Italy from 10 uh, to 20, uh, billion cubic meters a year. This will make a difference. It will make a difference. It won't solve, it will, it will, it will not be a comprehensive solution for the European. It most certainly will increase Azerbaijan's cloud there, but it will not be the solution to European problems. I would, uh, yes, I would, exactly, in fact, I uh, uh, phrase that slightly differently. It will not be a solution for the problems that Europe has created for itself through mm. its uh, failure to, uh, failure of vision. Yeah. We remember that particular stage when Europe had a chance to diversify, but didn't back then, 10, 15 years ago. And 2022 perhaps was a bit late. It's very clear that after the liberation of Azerbaijani territories, one of the key elements within government's policy is to ensure that all the high-tech technologies, green technology, smart cities are being applied there. Mm -hmm. And renewables is very important in this particular respect. Uh, how do you see Azerbaijani government's drive to enhance this element? It is responding to international demand. Mm. Uh, if the Europeans and the international financial institutions had not created incentives and political demands for Azerbaijan to develop a wind and solar, then Azerbaijan would have uh, not have so strong a motive as to, to develop wind and solar. For example, the Black Sea Cable, which is planned to transmit electricity, uh, if you uh, do the math, I've done the math, that the amount of electricity that will be transmitted via the Black Sea Cable from all of these uh, wind farms and windmills in, in Karabakh, or at least some, from some of them, uh, is equivalent to only about three and a half billion cubic meters of gas per year. You can generate the same amount of electricity with 3.5 billion cubic meters of gas in the broad scheme of things, that's not a lot of gas, but nevertheless, because of the incentives given to the Azerbaijan government, political incentives by the European Union, and financial incentives by the international financial institutions, uh, and a general uh, uh, climate of opinion in certain uh, sectors of international diplomacy, uh, that uh, Azerbaijan, it's to Azerbaijan's advantage to do this at the present time because of the circumstances. If, if, if 
If the international financial institutions had not decided in 2019 to cease sponsoring oil and gas pipelines, then it would be in Azerbaijan's interest to, to seek to build more oil and gas pipelines. But they are responding to the incentives that are offered to them. And that provision was entailed actually in the Memorandum of Understanding that Azerbaijan signed with the EU back in, yes. I think, July of 2022. Dr. Katla, I'm most grateful to you. Um, I think we had a comprehensive conversation. The many questions I wanted to put to you, but uh, time is very limited, and your time is limited as well. I'm very grateful to you. I very much hope that I will again very soon have self same opportunity to talk to you and put to you some of the questions which are of interest to me. Well, it's a pleasure. I thank you for the uh, for the invitation and for your excellent questions, and uh, I'm very happy to be in Baku in order to in order to answer them. And I uh, would look forward to speaking with you again next time I'm in Baku. I hope in the not distant future. Hopefully. Thank you very much.